understand that for a long time through the history of the Bible the Lord would establish people kings and places David and Samuel folks like that Solomon and they all had one common flaw one common mistake at their lowly state once they were anointed they embraced the charge of the father for the sake of Israel to have Israel become a nation to lead them into freedom because they were perpetually in some type of captivity oppression no, a not so good state but in every case as the blessings continued by their anointing something happened to each one of them instead of ruling the kingdom by the father's decrees they began to rule their kingdoms by their own decrees in other words once they established the kingdom they began to do what was in their own interests and not what was in God's interest and this is when they began to lose their kingdom and the people would go back into captivity back and forth switching the rulers and so forth the same thing happens today it certainly happens today the Lord has empowered people to do things to build things for his name's sake for the good of our brethren and yet once it's built they begin to do things for themselves what's in their best interest instead of relying on the Holy Spirit they then rely on the flesh that invites misery in one's efforts that thing we won't do Council of Time is and as I said before the name means something it's not just a random name it does mean something Council being the first word means that nothing will come from one human being or one person to the bullshit the rest because we're all accountable for whatever goes through this form and only in counsel and through prayer and through more counsel and through the reading of the word and more prayer can something be relevant and helpful otherwise it comes from one's own internal spirit and that that's the very thing we don't want here I'm cautious not to speak out of my own spirit that's why I redirect back into the word of God and it could be in line with the father but guess what if it's not the right timing then it's not helpful something out of time a word spoken out of time or out of my own spirit is dangerous it's dangerous it's more than just one person being held accountable it's that people may stumble that's what we do not want to happen we don't want people to stumble but I'd like to thank you for being here again we are into the book of Revelation we just completed the churches the churches and I'm sure that many people had uh, questions about Balaam did they not about Balaam taking away of uh, Balaam I think that was a question you guys posed last week before we begin to study the way of Balaam is when an individual takes money or wages or job over doing what's right as I said before this study of Revelation could be a toe stopper nevertheless it is God's word it is his word it's not my words but the way of Balaam is to forsake the right
right way of doing anything and to do something for the sake of wages or for the sake of money also or for recognition remember Cain whose sacrifice was not accepted he too took that established way took that established way oh and Tatum hold your voice we'll let you before we end this you can get you a song and we gotta get you a better headset too or something somebody point her to a good headset because you have a good voice you have a beautiful voice okay anyway this way of Balaam is a way where you accept money your own security and so forth over the established way of love itself because there are so many things that get in the way of the way of love so many things and one thing you have to remember certainly through the reading of the book of Revelation is that you're not of this world you're not of this world you're not of this world in fact you are of God because if you confess if you confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh if you do in fact confess that you are of God but be cautioned the love of God dwells in no one who hates their brother this is something we all need to work on quickly you know as you go through and you talk to people you find just as in days of old there's always a stumbling block always a stumbling block in the time of Christ when he walked this earth with men you had zealots who wanted to take the kingdom by force according to the Old Testament and Jesus specifically said no that is not the way they pointed out the wrongdoers not knowing within themselves they were wrong voiding the very presence of Jesus Christ his presence was out of love from the Father no hatred is justified in his coming to be slain for our sakes for the sins of the world no hatred is justified if you are walking with hatred in your life the love of God is not in you to hate your brother is to be a murderer and God knows what to do with everybody who is unrighteous in the end in fact let me look up a scripture there's a scripture for this hold on that's in um, 2 Peter chapter 2 9 the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished it's not our job it is not our job to continually point and exhaust that energy pointing out finding error in everybody else it is our job to stay within that realm of love Jesus established accepting his whole person into our lives and to dwell on that love he provides because within that love is our identity within his love is God knowing us outside of his love is the love of God not being in us and those who are outside of his love his grace and his mercies will have their portion with the fallen angels and by the way I did listen to brother Marcus and that was a beautiful show uh, for two nights and someone had a question his, uh, I forgot his name but someone said or there's a belief going around that we are fallen angels that some are fallen angels here well if we can refer to second Peter one more time we see something quite clearly second Peter chapter 2 verse 4 says for if God spared not the angels of sin but cast them down into hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment uh, that within itself 
tells us where they are, right? That's a pretty good subject because it's going to go into Revelation as we speak it. But the fallen angels are bound, the ones that fell in the days of Enoch, the ones that Enoch talked about. They're bound. They are bound. Oh, and by Jude, chapter 1 speaks of Enoch, saying this, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. So Jude references the book of Enoch, by the way, whom they did trust. But a tactic which was used to you to confuse you, to confound you, that you would not believe in the power of God, that your mindset would be in this realm of reality only, denying the power of God and justifying all the works of the Bible with scientific explanations. That must be broken also. People who take the ark, for instance, how many pictures of the ark have people showed you yet? Not one picture is accurate. If you go back and read yourself, you'll see it yourself. Then they try to say there were devices inside the ark. No, the power of God is the power of God. The same power that parted the waters and sustained them so that a multitude could go through the water. That same power. The power that was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. That same power. We can't justify this with our um, feeble minds of technology. We can't do that. The power of God is beyond our comprehension. Now that he will demonstrate. Because he did promise something. That one day, one day, all the wise men of this world would have to shut their mouths and they would have no explanation for what is happening. That would count all of their wisdom void. All of their science would be void. No mathematics would determine or figure out or come up with any type of hypothesis as to what's happening. Because the power of God is the power of God. He is not in a box, lest he be in a box in your mind. Which is to say, you may not have experienced the wonders of the Father. You may not have, but certainly have the love of God within you. Which is to operate in that love, not hatred. Not hatred. I don't like mentioning names, but Obama is a stumbling stone. Not one person out here in the world... Um, well, many people who talk against him, they have not met him. They have not met him. And if no one sin is greater than the other, does he still not deserve a hope from the redeemed of the Lord? Does he? Are we not supposed to pray for our leaders? What happened to that? Who are we to avoid that, to point at him? And how many times have people called a person antichrist and come to find out they were not. We have an obligation to live in the realm of love. Don't let him be a stumbling block. Don't let hatred cultivate within your systems. And then your energies are directed at he must pay for what he's doing. The Lord said, vengeance is mine. He did not say it was ours. He said it was his and his alone. See, if we spend more effort focusing on what we are to be in this world, things would be a little better than usual. But what we do is we have to vent anger. And personally, I don't like that term, vent. I don't believe in venting anything. I believe in casting things off and casting things down, casting down imaginations, taking captive my thoughts, being angry and sinning not by what? Casting them down 
hatred is born of things that should be cast off, cast out of you. Not walking in the flesh, which is of the world. No, I won't do that. And the world, by the way, is the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. And if you're prideful, you'll want someone to pay when something does not go your way. Leaders can be a stumbling block to you. They can be. But then a lot of people do not understand the nature of Satan himself. Satan, who has been in every single culture. Everybody wrote about Satan. Some called him Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent. The Chinese called him the great dragon, the great red dragon, the ancient dragon, Viracucha. You can keep the same person, Satan, whose name literally can be translated into, not to go into detail, but the giant, ancient, winged serpent of fire. And in America, your leaders call him Case to Rot, a dimensional being, the king of the world. By the way, they must meet him prior to taking a leadership role. Case to Rot is what they call him. Okay, enough of that, guys. Just, you know what? Purge yourself of this hatred thing because I see it surfacing every single day. It's surfacing, it's surfacing and taking over our brothers and sisters. But you know what, I also say this, I also say this, this can be heartbreaking, but it is the truth. Some of us will have brothers and sisters turned away. Families will begin to part. Friends will turn into enemies. We must be ready for this. Because the separation of those who believe and those who do not believe will certainly take place. You can't get around it. It's already in the Word of God. He warned us about it and asked us to totally trust in Him because He hears something. Here is something you need. If you do, in fact, trust in the Lord your God, if you do, in fact, embrace the love of Jesus Christ and the gospel of peace, then you will recover quickly, understanding that God cannot lie, that His words will not return void, that whatever He said will come to pass, that the prophecies have already been declared. When the prophets were here, he has declared them. And this is why, in the books of Isaiah and Ezekiel and so forth, everyone was terrified to say anything prophetic because the truth was established and people knew the truth. They knew the truth. Folks, it's time for us to get out. We have to dust off our... It's time to walk in truth. If we say we dwell in the shadow of the Almighty, then let us do the things of the Almighty, which was established in this world through Jesus Christ. Let us do those things. If the love of God is within us, we will overcome the world. That's also in Scripture. The love of God will remain in us, and we in Him. We will not go on sinning. I know that's hard to swallow. But to overcome the world means He will withhold you from that because you'll be in Him. We must walk in the Spirit. We can't be like, listen, I'm telling you, we cannot be like King David, Solomon, 
and all these guys in the Old Testament who acted first and then asked God later to forgive them. We must consult the words of Jesus Christ and then move forward in pureness, which is to move forward in a full belief of Him, not giving into strange doctrine or earthly powers that will rise. Earthly powers will rise. And if you're running from power to power, from pleasant word to pleasant word, you're going to be like the ocean waves, tossed to and fro, all over the place, seeking and never finding. Then you will, in fact, begin to drown and lose your way. Now, it's not off of the teachings of Jesus Christ. His teachings fight the very name. The Old Testament, that was a testament of war, of establishment, of the law. Men died if they could not keep the law. Yet those who were in charge oppressed the sick and the weak because of the law. And so Jesus came to fulfill the law and his gift to mankind. And if we remain in him, we will keep the law because we have power to do so in him. Don't make excuse for your sins. If there's no other warning given, don't make excuse for your sins. Don't do it. Anything Jesus asked us to do, we are capable of doing. Remember that. And if you do it in love, you can accomplish it. The shortcoming is faith. And the biggest shortcoming is this. You will do what you want to do. Whatever you want to do, that's what you're going to do. If you want to sin, you're going to corrupt yourself through sin. If you want to serve God, He becomes most important. And you will, in fact, cast down imaginations and so forth. But it takes a sacrifice, not a real one, but just a sacrifice of the lust of the flesh and the pride of life, which is also the world. And we are not of this world, so you can't overcome it. By the way, everything I just told you was in Scripture. It's in the New Testament. It's in Scripture. It's in Scripture. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. Okay, now we get to continue with Revelation. Oh, having said that, having said that, it was a very long weekend for me. While I'm in this process, uh, I will have those, um, the uh, church charts up there, so you guys can see them. I think they're important to see, so that we can um, begin to peel away ourselves, because we certainly do have a mixture, a, a wide variety of backgrounds and cultures and ways and beliefs and so on but you know what if we do love our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ if we do accept him as the son of God if we do believe that he came in the flesh and died on the cross for our sins then we will conform to his word you don't and you know what It'll, you'll do it out of love itself it's not going to be scary for you to do it's going to be something you want to do. And this is the transition we must make. We have to go from, you know, I want to do right because I don't want to burn, to I love my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and I want to do this. I believe in the cause that he came for. Let me be a part of it. When you do that, you'll begin to recognize his love towards you. When you recognize his love towards you, then that love is perfected and it casts down all fear. Then you can journey in the gross darkness with no problem. 
But if you have fear in your life of those things to come, I'm telling you now, you're unsure about your salvation. To be unsure about your salvation is not to be confident that he's going to stand for you in that day. And if you're not confident he's going to stand for you, I can tell you now you have not done all you can do to stand for him. So I suggest this in the greatest of humility that we do everything we can do knowing that we did all we can do to stand that's a scripture and there's a key to that scripture if you have not performed if you have not done all you can do to stand within the principles of Christ if you've not done all you can do you will have insecurities Let's, uh, let's imagine that all of us are mechanics and we have to take a road trip in the desert where there's no gas station, no repair shops, no anything. If you check your vehicle over haphazardly, when you get down, when you begin your journey in that desert, because you're going to think in your head, did I check the gas? Did I check the coolant? Did I check the tire pressure? Did I check this? Did I check that? You're going to be scared your entire trip because your car might break down. However, if you have thoroughly checked every single component of that vehicle before your car trip, you're going to be a whole lot more confident than the person who missed something on purpose because they simply didn't want to do it. When you leave your homes to go on a trip, how many people leave their homes and then immediately, Im immediately ask themselves, did I turn the stove off? Did I really lock the back door? Did I do this? Did I do that? And you worry yourself sick not knowing if you did that or not. Had you checked thoroughly prior to you leaving and been sure you did everything you could do, Or your trip. But most people, sometimes they don't check thoroughly. And so their ride is not so enjoyable because they're constantly wondering did they leave something undone? We can't be like that in this world. We have to do everything we can do to stand. We cannot put in 50% because you will be nervous in that day of darkness. Now that day of darkness can be different for all of us. There will come a trial, a tribulation, a refinement of fire in your life. See, because everything must be torched in high temperatures. So only the real material is left. All impurities will burn off. If you have not done everything you can do when the trials, when the storms, when the tempests, when the darkness, when the flames come. You're going to have fear. You will have fear. All of you soldiers out there, you know this is a fact. If you've checked all your gear prior to a deployment, prior to combat, you're confident in your gear because you did everything you could do to ensure you had everything and everything was functional. But if you have not, you're a nervous wreck. And sadly, the end result is normally you become a casualty. That's what happens. You become a casualty. You may not die, but you'll become a casualty. And we are walking around sometimes as casualties in the world simply because we did not do all we could do. That should be something we should all do continuously. Make sure that we can do that we do everything that we can do. Because I don't know about you, but I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in healings. All the miracles Jesus did, Jesus did, I do right now believe that the potential resides within us based upon our faith. But your faith is tainted if you have not stood on the Word of God. How can you have faith in something when you know you didn't do your part? This is a hindrance to faith. Because as soon as you try or attempt to think of something of that magnitude, you'll doubt 
instantly. You'll doubt because you'll say, well, I, I did this and surely he's, you know, that. I don't know. Don't walk around in life unsure. Don't, we don't have to do that. We do not have to walk around unsure. And I, you know what? Those powers, that potential to bring those gifts to other people could manifest. But your faith is in jeopardy because we're only putting in 75%, 50%, 90%. We're not doing everything we can do. And so doubt will hit your mind. It'll hit your mind. But if you do all of what you can do, then you can stand boldly, having that measure, even that fraction of measure of faith, to perform that because you did your part. But how can you have faith in doing the Lord's work when you know yourself you did not do what you could do? You didn't do all of what you can do. That has to be cleared up also. We are children of God. You are, in fact, the child of God. So then why do we walk as men and as women, having had nothing bestowed upon us? Why do we do this? We have received the instructions. We have received the counseling. We know how to pray. We know how to consider. So then why do we still allow ourselves to hold back when we should be stepping forward. Why do we do this? Okay. We're going to get into the churches. And again, I will put the charts up to the characteristics of the churches. I think they're very important. I think they're extremely important. So forgive me for not doing that uh, beforehand because I need to get those up there we can identify a multitude of characteristics within ourselves if we get those up there but as I said before one church did everything right it seemed they did everything right yet they didn't put in 100% they didn't give 100% ok after we got through with the churches now understand that each church Jesus walks in the midst of the seven churches. The seven stars are in his right hand, which are the seven angels of that church. Seven angels of, of those uh, churches. And so then he, he, Jesus Christ, our Savior, he will judge them. He's the one that gave these letters to them, telling them what he would do if they did not do it his way. The apostles wrote about their faults and failures, and those faults and failures and shortcomings and the wrong highway they took it still exists today. It's just that it, the magnitude is increasing. It's very deceitful, but it is increasing. Okay, we're in chapter 4 of Revelation. If you guys want to go ahead and, and jump over to them. Now, as I said before, um, during the readings of Revelation, I will, in fact, impart uh, some of my knowledge concerning this. Some things I've not shared before. But... Uh, above hearing me or anybody else and any things you may hear consult the word of God go back and read it meditate on it pray about it if you doubt anything in the word of God then you ask your father for revelation that's all you need to do and don't just ask and forget that you ask but you go boldly to the throne and ask him because see if you really need something if you really need something, you will pester the Lord to pieces until you get it. You'll wrestle just like, just like, um, just like, uh, was that Jacob that wrestled with the angel? You'll wrestle for your answer. That's called going boldly to the throne. And you can only go boldly to the throne if you've done all you can do. But certain things you need. You are a child of God. Don't ever let Satan tell you. You're not a child of God. Don't let him do that. 
Don't let him do that. Yes, we need a purging. Yes, we need instruction from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and from the words he wrote. This is why we have pastors and, and teachers and so forth. I really don't count myself as a teacher. I'm just someone that's very sincere about what I believe. I mean extremely sincere, radically sincere. And I also know that's the only way that's going to help anybody. All other ways will fail. The world's ways will fail. Doctrines of hatred people constantly hollering God's judgment is upon this earth you know what we're going to see this in Revelation and I'll tell you this if you think God's judgment is upon the earth right now you're going to have a heart attack when it gets here see there's a law in place it's called reaping and sowing right whatsoever man reap that he's going to sow that nations are sowing and they are reaping and they are sowing again and reaping that's what's happening if you build any nation upon blood that nation will collapse by blood if you live by the sword you're going to die by the sword some of these nations have lived by war and guess what that same nation will be removed by war Iraq is a very good example of that Syria is a very good example of that. Egypt is a very good... You know what happened to Egypt? They lived by oppressing others, by switching sides, changing their um, flagship from one country to another, and look how they're folding up into pieces. The same process that they governed by has come back upon them. And if you think that this is judgment, oh, you just wait until the real judgment gets here. Because men and women, if you're caught in that judgment, in any place where that judgment will fall, it's going to wreak havoc on you. It'll be a not-so-good day for anybody left. And if you think this is judgment, what we're experiencing now, there's no great war or calamity going on. They're sowing seeds. And they're going to have to eat from their own garden. But once you see them bought down to the valley of decision, well then, you know what's coming. But the heavens will rain in blood and ice and rocks and cinders and fire prior to that happening. So let us get into the book of Revelation and put these things in order. Now, for those of you who are experts in the book of Revelation, I can say this. I'm only going to teach this as it's written. Revelation for ultimate understanding is the Father's responsibility. I will not theorize. I will not assume. I will not add my knowledge to the book of Revelation to make something seem a proper way. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to change anything. The only thing I will do is share a tiny bit of insight into certain subjects brought out in Revelation. But I'm not going to change anything or come to any conclusions. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. That's dangerous. Because God gives revelation. And when he gives revelation, he doesn't just give it to one person. He gives it to his body. See, in the old times past, they had prophets. And the word of God came to the prophet. The prophet put it out to everybody. In this day and age, because we have the Holy Spirit, he's not going to reveal it just to one individual person. He's going to pour that truth out on those who believe in him. They will have an agreement of what the Holy Spirit pours out. And they will all see it, that none will be ignorant. He's not just going to give it to one person. And I'm not an expert in God's Word. And you know what? No one's an expert in God's Word. You know who is the expert in God's Word? Is God is. God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. They are experts. 
I am not, nor are you. I'm sorry if your the education that was given by men, uh, your diploma written by men, says that you are an expert. Because God says we're not. Not. We're not. Okay, let's continue. Chapter 4. After this I looked, and behold, the door was open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. He that sat was to look upon like jasper and sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white remnant. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like unto a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had the face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about them, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day or night, saying, Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Let's halt for a minute. This is a nugget we're getting. The next time a prideful situation wants to come out in your lifetime, remember something. God created all things, and for his pleasure they are and were created. For his pleasure. That kind of takes your heavenly importance out of things, doesn't it? We exist under His grace because He loves us. For God so loved this world that He gave His only begotten Son. Can you imagine Him looking at the world, at its past, at its future, and saying, I love them? And before He created anything, Jesus did exist. He did exist. He was prepared. And at a tumultuous time when men were cruel to one another, cruel, abusively cruel, he sent his son when humanity was at its worst, not when it was at its best. When it was at its worst, not only did Jesus Christ redeem us, but he also redeemed those who slept, those who died, those who fell short. Live or not, whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And when he was on the cross, the earth did shake. Because from that point on, everybody had that opportunity. But we exist for his pleasure. His pleasure. Let us not think of ourselves important, lest it be in bringing the gospel of peace and love and humility and meekness. But don't let pride into your hearts. We are all important to him, or he would not have sent his son. Yet, we still exist for his pleasure. All things were created for his pleasure. Chapter 5 And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within, and on the backside sealed with seven seals. 
And as I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open the book and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Stop right there for a second. Did you guys catch that? The lamb that had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Now we know we have seven churches, right? Seven candlesticks, seven churches. In his right hand are the seven stars, which are the seven angels of the church. If this were past tense, if these were church ages, then why the number seven and why are all of them in his right hand? How come some are passed away? And he had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Do you not know that even on the beast, the beast's horns represented authority? These seven horns are seven spirits of God. seven spirits of God could they be now this is me could those seven spirits of God in fact be those seven established churches their influence with the seven stars seven stars seven churches seven spirits of God seven now there's something about the seven spirits of God that's repeated over and over again and we'll define them later. But it's important to remember this in the context of this book. Seven spirits of God. Seven spirits. Please note that somewhere. The seven horns and the seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. They're sent forth into all the earth. The seven spirits of God are sent forth into all the earth. Make a note of that. Please make a note of that. Because we will, we most certainly will have to revisit that. And this will destroy some confusion that's out there right now. This will destroy it. Yet, I already know many will not share this, although it's in the Bible. But, it will destroy some utter confusion. Let's continue verse 7. And he came hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials, full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. Let's stop right there real quick. You guys heard the, the, the new song thing spoken by many people, right? Well, we can see the song of Moses. And, and yes, we're going to get rid of some, you know, what well, a lot of people think things, but there are a few new songs here. Um... This is one, the first one. They sang a new song, and the words are right here. The song of Moses, those words are in the book too. But what we want to do is not carry in assumptions into the book of Revelation this time. We need to get rid of assumptions. See, if you assume something, there's no room for God to give you revelation. You reject it. If you don't assume something and it's left empty, the Lord will fill it up. Let the Lord fill up your understanding with his wisdom. Don't assume because that's using your wisdom. Okay? 
And I can tell you right now, our earthly wisdom is based in the things of the world. It is not based of God. So let God give revelation and understanding and wisdom according to what He has written, not according to what suits our life at the time and our understanding and what may make us feel good, because some of His revelation won't make you feel good. It will utterly convict you to tears. But that's a good thing to break the flesh and the pride of life. That's a good thing. Also, we are speaking, we are speaking, we are speaking, specifically speaking of the elders who sung a new song. And in the words it says, they were redeemed by God by the blood out of every kindred tongue people and nation every not just some every and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth let's continue verse 11 and I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and a thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing, and honor, and glory, and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb for ever and ever. And the four be said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Okay, you know, you know what? Here's something. It said, it said, everybody was saying this, saying with a loud voice, worthy as a lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, and glory, and blessing, and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, all of them, blessed him at this time. Everything, his creation, blessed him. Of the creatures, his creation blessed him. That is his spirit of spirits. And you know what? I have to bring this fact down. Every time, nature within itself, Scientists will tell you one thing, that through genetics, you know, trees start changing leaves and this, that, and the other, right? But who's going to put the picture together and realize this first? That one, science has, has a hard job of explaining these things because they can't figure out the clockwork of nature yet. Number two, number two, the days, the holidays, on God's calendar right everything is set to obey those days it's not the opposite way around the sun obeys his calendar the moon obeys his calendar the host of heaven the stars everything you see obeys his calendar he did not make his calendar after the lights he created and the stars he created he made everything for his pleasure and everything observes his calendar it's not the opposite way around. But hear me. In science, they know for a fact that during the days when Christians give praises, they call it a praise inwardly. Something that responds big time. Nature does respond. It's almost like it helps nature. When people give God praises, but the opposite is also true. When people do not give God praises, scientists have found that nature seems to go out of whack. Go out of whack. And you know what? There are people who are noticing these dead fish and birds and this, that, and the other. And for you scientists out there, you know, I'm educated also in the sciences. And I do utterly believe that a lot of it is garbage. I do. I excelled in the sciences. I held a pretty good GPA. 
And I can tell you that it's, it's a lot of assumption, theory, and garbage. Because most microbiologists, those who observe living tissue, understand that there are certain times of the season that all life yields to these specific days. And if you do some digging out, you'll find it yourself. Even your body. How many of you know that every seven days, your body physically rests? Whether you do or not, your body does. How many people know that? How many people know that every three days that your body attempts to repair itself? How many people know that? Every three days, your body goes through a cycle, and it attempts to grab all the minerals and vitamins and proteins and everything else to begin to repair, um, you know, unfortunate DNA strands that are trying to be altered and this, that, and the other every three days. But every seven days, your body does rest. So we actually, our bodies do yield to the times the Father set in motion. Whether you rest or not, your body does. It attempts to. It attempts The bad part about your body repairing is that in a lot of cases it cannot get the minerals and vitamins and specific proteins it needs to do the repair job, you know, properly. They are starving folks of that. And all they have to do is go out and run and get a multivitamin and some type of protein substitute. And your body will have everything it needs to begin to repair itself on those cycles. It will. It's not even, it's something that's known, yet something that's not shared or is obscured on purpose for the sake of money, the way it belongs again. Okay, now we start on the seals. Let's start on the seals. And I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. He that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering, and to conquer. Okay, that was the, that was the first seal. First seal, right? Now, many people say, many people say that this is yet to come, right? This is yet to come. But you know what I noticed? I noticed... I'm just pointing something out to you. I noticed he had a bow. He had a bow. But he had no arrow. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Right? A long time ago, on the Isle of Patmos, right after John wrote Revelation, the wars of wars began. And they haven't stopped since. Prior to his time, Rome did control parts of things, right? They were still warring, never to the level when they began to record things after Jesus Christ. To this day, to this day, many nations and leaders have this spirit over them where they have to conquer. Now, if you look closely, this same spirit is in your homes, at your job. It's everywhere. But a crown meaning authority. He had the authority. Authority was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. That spirit would appear to have been released a long time ago. A long time ago. Because from that time we have had wars and rumors of wars and they have not ceased in the Old Testament it said that wars and desolations were determined until the end that's what it said in the Old Testament but this writer went forth conquering and to conquer if this were to come in the future what would we call this similar spirit or same spirit what would we call it now 
I'll share with you one delusion of the enemy, something we use on our enemies of the United States and something other enemies use toward us. One of the greatest deceiving things you can do to another nation is to make them believe, like Russia's doing everybody else, to make them believe something is going to happen in the future when in fact it's in progress right now. That's one of the best and most basic deceiving practices an army can have. Because if you can point the direction of the other army into a future happening, while you're talking to them and having telling lies at one table and so forth, they'll never know you're taking over everything. Right? Napoleon did the same thing. Rome did the same thing. Iran, the Persian Empire, they did the exact same thing in the time of Daniel. They snuck up on King Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, Babylon. They had, Babylon was forced to surrender. It was under new kingship. Same thing happened. Because they made them believe that it could potentially happen in the future. When they were taking Crimea, everybody knows that story of Russia. When they were taking Crimea, not too long ago, right? People said, oh, they might invade Crimea. They had troops around it and everything else. And then without warning, they took it. And even when they were taking it, they said, oh, they, oh, they took over this small base right here. Right? Then when the smoke settled, where was the placement? First of all, they took over all centers in Crimea. They didn't show you that part on the news. They did not tell you the rightful number that was over there, just like they're doing the Ukraine. They're not going to share with you the real numbers. They're not going to tell you the sputs, not truths, are in the heart of the Ukraine. They're not going to tell you that Joe Biden went over there, right? Because if a foreign president from the United States is in a country and something happens to that vice president or president, that's a declaration of war. Right now, as it stands, Russia does not want a declaration of war seen by the public. He's not in position yet, but he will be, because the longer we stall, the more troops that are going in there, the more troops that are taking over buildings. What you don't know is the invasion has already started, and because they're telling you that there's been no troop invasion, in, in invasion which it hasn't, because they're all special operations forces in the heart of the Ukraine. And because they have not told you this, you don't worry about it. But if they were to say right now, they invaded the Ukraine. Some of you would instantly say, here we go. This has to be it. This has to be it. But they didn't tell you that, yet the invasion has already begun. See, this white horse, same thing. Same thing. A crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Which means, listen, he went forth conquering, which means he did it, and to conquer the future mindset was to keep doing it. Did you get that? He went forth conquering, which means he was doing it, and to conquer. So he'll still do it. A bow is a posture. A bow is a weapon. A bow is a weapon. Okay, number three. We'll take a break after number three. And when he had opened the second seal, well, we'll take a break after the second seal. I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given unto him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. Great sword. Now, you know what? When I first looked at this, to take peace from the earth, I want to ask you a serious question. What year, what century, since the death of Jesus Christ, have you known the world to have any peace? And those who say it had a little peace, do you understand the lies? The, the bloodshed? From the day this was written, billions have died. Name one nation where blood was not involved in its establishment. Name one. Name one. That's right, Louise. But see, guess what? Again, if you can keep, be convinced that none of this has happened yet, nobody has this spirit upon them. 
of conquering and going forth to conquer if you can convince somebody of that or if they believe that then the future holds nothing because the fact is men and leaders upon this earth have had this mindset for a very long time there has been no peace on the earth that's why in the prophecies it says when they say peace and safety see that's an objective that we have never reached it's an objective after World War I after World War II everybody went home and they had no peace in their own nations here's the fallacy most people think of the mistake they'll say well what that means is what that means is that uh, there'll be no wars and that's not what it says he had a sword a great sword in his hand a great sword in his hand that people would kill one another now after World War II soldiers came back home and what happened they were killing one another they just didn't report the death toll in Germany they were killing one another they just didn't report the death toll everybody went home and they were killing one another see if they're not fighting against another nation they're killing each other in their own nations there's been no peace there's been no peace no peace no peace in America right now violence is consuming the populace violence is they just don't report it in Russia violence is consuming the populace in Germany violence is consuming the populace certainly in Africa in China all nations are having this issue but we must read the words and understand them if this was for the future we'd have peace right now would we not would we not wars and rumors of wars there will be wars and rumors of wars all right we're going to take a break and then we're going to come back to the third seal because they get really interesting after this really interesting but these horses as it appears they, they these spirits these horsemen who are given one given a crown one given a sword to take peace from the earth we've had no peace and everybody every nation has been positioned in my opinion it is not coming it is happening and, and you know what those in a delusion do not realize it's a delusion the doctor says a person is delusional the individual does not because to him it's reality only the doctor can say you're delusional but the person will say no I'm not delusional this is the way it is think of that and we shall be right back okay and we are back everybody back everybody have uh, something to drink you know what if we cannot see what's happening right now then uh, we are somewhat delusional we um, we send this out to about 22 networks because I'm trying to get it out there to anybody I can so that we can stream other ministries through Council of Time to all we can stream and it's not corporate owned um, so they can't shut it down I still have that um, that, that feeling that um, policy will be implemented and freedom of speech concerning insulting another religion on a uh, public venue through a corporation will likely be um, censored and so when it's censored uh, I would love for COT to be in place to um, continue to deliver God's message out you know in the time allotted to other folks because censorship will eventually come it will eventually come okay everybody can hear me okay hopefully that'd be a good thing okay yes we can the lights are green 
third seal. Everybody understand the first two seals. They're, they're very simplistic in nature, very straightforward, uh, but they are um, in progress. Remember at the beginning it said, Blessed is he that reads the words of this prophecy. It also said, The time is at hand. It is at hand. It is happening. It is not going to happen. It is happening. You guys remember that? And forgive me, ladies, if I say you guys. I'm going to lump you in with there. I'll just say, ladies and gentlemen, you remember that. How about that? That's the uh, look, look better socially adapted here. Okay, in the third seal which is Revelation chapter 6, verse 5. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see, thou heard not the oil and the wine. All right, let's pause real quick. The black horse, the scales in his hand. You know what? If you look at this scale, um, that he held, this horse, and everything was measured for money, right? Everything was measured for money. For money. You know what? We have a global economic system. Even the poor nations need money to operate. There is no more. I'm in my country. I can go farm myself because if you don't pay money, you can't keep the food you grow. Or certainly you can't sustain your garden. You can't do it. Everything is measured for money. There is an economic system right now. It's not coming. It's here right now. Notice, notice. Now, now, a lot of people say, well, this is an economic collapse. But see, I'm going to be honest with you. That's not what I'm saying. I don't see a collapse. I see a system where you have to pay for your substance. That's what I say. I do not see a collapse. I see a system, a measure of wheat for a penny. And three measures of barley for a penny. I see an economic system in place. I do not see this horse as being an economic collapse. If it were an economic collapse, it would say no measure of barley for a penny. Or maybe a measure of barley for a talent or something more expensive, you know, not certainly not for a penny. This seems to indicate that there's an economic system in play. And it says, hurt not the oil or the wine to the rider. Now, we could use this in a physical sense. And we could try to say, well, that's just to, you know, to make sure, make sure that nobody gets the oil, you know, it, but that's not the case because it said, hurt not the oil or the wine. This is saying, this is saying, this, right, oil and wine, the, these are, I would not look at these as a physical thing, not the oil and the wine, because they're hurting the oil, right? They're hurting the oil. They, they're just taking the cushion out of the crust of the earth called oil and using it up. However, it is something largely sought after because our mobility is based off of this ancient thing called black nectar, oil, right? However, what if the oil was the anointing and the wine was the gospel? What if, what if that were the case? If the oil and the wine were spiritual things, have you ever thought of that? Now again, let God give the revelation. I'm just simply throwing you something here. There's an economic system in play, yet the anointing still exists in Christianity. The Bible has perpetuated. And the gospel 
is continuing to go throughout the globe. And you know what? This gospel of the kingdom, which was Jesus Christ, will be preached throughout all the world. Hmm, isn't that something? So, we have an economic system. And it cannot get in the way. Of the you know what? Even in the poorest times, the gospel has gone forth. Where the rich or poor, nothing has shut the mouth or the feet of the gospel. It always endures. And the Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit is here. That anointing, that empowerment is here. Despite the economic system in place that can halt everything else. See, economics can stop you from doing a lot of things. It can stop you from buying a house. It can stop you from eating and everything else. But guess what? Nothing, nothing has stopped the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing, nothing can stop the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Nothing. Nothing, nothing. Of course, let God be the revelation on this. Ask Him for revelation. Ask Him. You know, if you don't understand this, don't assume. But even in my spirit, this oil and this wine is not natural. He sent these riders out based off of a seal that was opened, something that entered the earth. Something that entered the earth. An economic system and the spirit to perpetuate an economic system did flood and go into the earth. We live under an economic system now. It is in the earth. Okay, and the fourth seal, and when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the beast, fourth beast say, come and see, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with the sword, hunger, with death, and with the beast of the earth, stop. I don't know if you've ever looked into this, but we have a multitude of tools at our fingertips. We have something called the senses. Whenever somebody dies, right? Everybody wants to know why that person died. What killed them? Then they write it down and throw it in something called a census, right? Figures, numbers. This is how they come up with statistics. Now, it's just funny. This is funny. How can a number now said they had they that uh, these these it was given unto them they had power over a fourth part of the earth. Now it just so happens that on a global scale, in a ratio of the population, that one quarter of the population continuously dies from all manner of things, war, disease, hunger, and of course, death itself, natural causes, they say, which, by the way, natural causes is a very loose term for things that they don't want to, you know, write down, like uh, aneurysms, mostly. But how can the global census dictate that there's a quarter part of the earth, of the population of the earth? Right? Not only one quarter of the population is continuously dying, continuously dying, but if you look at the re if you look at the global map of the census and the numbers that have been collected, in all the places in the area of all the continents, it would appear that one quarter of it is full of death all the time. Now, how in the world can that happen? It's perpetual. Perpetual. You know, you have to you have to think. If one quarter of the earth, if one quarter of the population died, we have a birth rate too, right? So that one quarter is made up. We have a birth rate. But that means if we try to apply this all at one time, it would be void because people are born all the time. But one quarter of the earth is dying all the time, and it seems to reside in a ratio that won't change. 
It just won't change. I find that you guys can look this up yourself. Do your homework. Go look at it. You'll see that one quarter of the population is continuously dying from a host of causes. From a host of causes. Now, if this were to come in the future, right, for this to be in effect, that means there would have to be no birth at that time. If one quarter of the earth died, there would have to be no birth. In order for one quarter of the earth to die and stay dead, because as soon as one quarter dies, one quarter is born again, right? If the babies are born, this is a perpetual thing. I'm just saying this to make the point to say we're in the middle of this stuff, of these things that God sent out into the earth. And the Lamb opened those seals. But we have to focus our attention in walking in the truth of His love. See, the gospel was named the gospel of peace. Not the gospel of accusation. Not the gospel of vengeance. None of that. But the gospel of peace. So we have to learn to recognize His hand in this world and not try and make His hand do what we want it to do. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. But we have a job to do here, which is to bring the gospel of peace to our brothers and sisters. Ultimately, we must tell the truth. We cannot conform his word to the world's lies to suit the world, to, to attempt to postpone uh, events so that we can play some more. I don't want the end to come. I just bought a new house. I want to enjoy it. That's a very selfish thought. We're focused on him, right? The new house wouldn't mean a thing because we would all know that without him, everything we touch and have is doomed. Ultimately, everything is going up in flames anyway. It'll utterly be destroyed. If our minds are stayed on him, no physical substance will take your attention. None. But if you're saying you just accomplished something in the world and you want to enjoy it, your attention is not on Jesus Christ and his gospel. Your attention is on your own walk. Not on him. That's, by the way, that's called, he said something about that. Those who try to save their lives will lose it. Those who lose their lives for his sake will find it. That's called trying to save your life. That's what that is. When you try to hold on to the substance of this world to enjoy it and forsaking his word at the same time and or, and or, making bad decisions to enjoy yourself over doing what you were called to do something that's not good however however if he has blessed you with something and to you it's a tool right to you it's a tool for the sake of his ministry different story because you have not made that thing your God you, you're not worshipping it but if we worship things well then we're messing up where if we worship anything, you know, one of the Ten Commandments said that um, thou shalt not bow down thyself to any engraven image above the earth, beneath the earth, or in the earth. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity upon the fathers and to the children to the third, fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy to the thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. And by the way, that's not a good ratio. And we are to worship the Lord thy God with all our heart, with all our might, with all our soul. He said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So if, we're worship, if something is taking our worship away from him, our praises away from him, if we're praising our car, well, it's, you're not going to have it long. Either that, most people these days, and I'm going to be factual with you, Instead of them losing something, they'll just cancel their whole religion. I'm telling you the truth. This is what I'm noticing. This is what's wrong with people say people saying I'm tired. See, when you get tired, you're forced in a corner to make a choice. When you're tired and you stay tired long enough, 
you'll eventually act upon something. But you know what the Word said? If you wait upon the Lord, blessed are those who wait upon the Lord. Their strength will be renewed in Him. We have to wait upon Him. Okay, I don't want to get off track. But see, there are things that we have to contend with in life, in other people's attitudes that we, we cannot, simply cannot adopt. We are to love them, never to hate them. You know, it's not a competition here. It's about love, and it's about truth, and it's about the life, which is Jesus Christ. Okay, we're going to continue. Now, when that seal opened, everything went wrong. But listen to this. Just listen. Chapter 7. After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. There's no wind blowing anywhere. Right? No wind. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And of course, 12,000 from the tribe of Judah, Reuben, Gad, Aser, all the, these are all the 12 tribes were sealed. I'm not going to go through all the names. You guys can do that. I'm not going to go through all the names. All the, now, hear me out. These were the children of the 12 tribes of Israel, 144,000. These are the children of those tribes of 144,000. And after this, I beheld lo, a great multitude. Now, pay attention. After the angel sealed the 144,000 of the 12 tribes of Israel, after he sealed them, after John saw this, he said, After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man can number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence they came? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. Let's examine this. He saw the 144,000 being sealed. All of a sudden he sees this great multitude, which no man can number, of all nations, kindreds, tongues, and languages. And white robes were given to them. Doesn't that sound familiar? Garments, white robes, garments. And who were these people? Who were these people? One of the elders said, uh, was asking him, Who are these people? And where do they come from? And of course John said, You know, I don't know, you know. And he said, These are they which came out of great tribulation stopped. So, wait, hope. 
stop the press, the train, the buses, cars, cabs, everything else. A great tribulation. So now we have a group under the altar who were slain for the word of God, for the testimony they held, right? Right? We have 144,000 being sealed from the children of all the 12 tribes of Israel. And now John sees a great multitude of every nation, language, color, race, everything else, which no man can number, by the way. No man can number the amount of people that were there. And he said, who are these? And it was said to him, these are they which came out of great tribulation, listen, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, which is Jesus Christ. These are the real believers in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's who these are. You know what? I'm sorry if people have other theories about that, but they made it out of great tribulation. Here's what got me. When you read through Revelation, as you will with me, you see people killed and mar you see martyrs, right? Except for the 144,000, everybody else is getting beheaded and killed. But then you see this large group of people that nobody can number who made it out of great tribulation. What does that indicate? First of all, they made it out of great tribulation, which means they were in great tribulation. Okay? They made it out of great tribulation, which means they were in it. But they made it out. They made it out. It didn't say they were killed. That's not what it said. It didn't say they were slain for the word of their testimony. It's not what it said. It didn't say they were martyrs. It's not what it said. It said they made it out of great tribulation. Remember what we read? One of the churches said specifically, said specifically, that God has set an open door before them. And then in verse 10 of chapter 3, it said, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. You guys remember that? Remember when Jesus said, Pray that you are worthy to escape all these things, after he mentioned what was coming upon the earth? It would appear that these people took that advice and they came out of great tribulation. It did not tell you how they came out. It just said they came out of great tribulation. But I found it curious that all the other people died and were, were killed for the word of their testimony. But it didn't say that here. They came. came. Look at their condition. Therefore are they before the throne and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne dwell among them. They shall hunger no more. They were hungry. Neither thirst any more. These people didn't have ample provisions in that great tribulation. Nor any heat. Revelation confirms it's very hot during those days as we're going to see. They won't thirst any more. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. He couldn't count. No man could count the number of people that were there. But not once did I read that they were killed. Now, you have some people that say, I'm just simply reading the Word of God, and I found something curious here that they came out of great tribulation. It did not specifically say they were killed or anything else. But Jesus did say something curious. First he said, pray that you are worthy to escape these things. Then he said, after a specific time, then two will be in the field, one will be taken the other way. Two in a bed, one taken the other way. Then he was talking about where the carcass is. There where the eagles gather. That's what he said. And then you have a, a Paul thing, the sound at, at the last trump, with the voice of the archangel. See, people with the voice of the archangel. 
those who are alive will be caught up in the air and they'll forever be with the Lord eagles don't walk when they gather first of all they they don't walk you know, how come he didn't say if, if it was on the ground he should have said you know something lambs walking right or something like that but he didn't he said where the eagles gather there the carcass is I'm just telling you my curiosity in this scripture let God give the revelation in his time we'll all know the truth won't we we'll know the truth but I do stick and thank you Fitz because I do stick to this when the Lord in prayer on more than one occasion the Lord continuously reveals to me that in fact we left Egypt and are in the desert we are in the desert the process is yet again and you know there are other scriptures that said uh, concerning Babylon come out of her that you may not partake of her plagues but continuously in prayer we're in the desert this is why I'm adamant to the fact that you know what people's provisions will be provided as needed you're having a hard time figuring out your um, way of life the way you used to it doesn't work that way look at the character of the people who came out of great tribulation they were hungry hungry naked stripped of most things thirsty hot very hot they were exposed to the conditions of the world that's what, it's, that's what I'm that's what I'm saying they were exposed to the conditions of the world they made it out of great tribulation and it was a number that no man can number okay let's continue and when he had opened the seventh seal there was silence in the heaven for about the space of been half an hour now remember the silence and I saw the seven angels were stood before God to them were given seven trumpets and another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer and it was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand and the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake stop right there didn't the Lord say vengeance is mine didn't the Lord say that he said vengeance is mine right these prayers which came up from all the saints there was no time period on there he didn't say just the saints that were left over at the time that he didn't say that he said the prayers of all the saints and God said vengeance is mine he told us to hold our peace hold our peace he takes vengeance well look what just happened and didn't we read in Isaiah where it says these are the days of vengeance didn't we just read that in Isaiah 34 these are the days of vengeance he just opened the sixth seal now the seventh was opened to secure his folk and now the prayers go up and the Lord poured out the vengeance upon the earth now payday is here but the Lord said he said so many things be angry sin not hold your peace he told Peter when Peter slashed off at those who live by the sword down by the sword this is a gospel of peace love your enemy love 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 vengeance is mine don't take vengeance yourself it is mine well we see it right here the censor the censor that came with the prayer the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake you know what every time he spoke 
God spoke something, decreed something, declared something that would not be taken back. There were thunderings involved, lightnings. This can't be taken back. And of course, the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Look at the first angel. And the first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth, and a third part of the trees was burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Stop. Okay. That's not good. Can you imagine, of the entire earth, all the green grass burned up and one third of the trees? Do you not understand the heat involved to do that? That's what I want to get in your head here. In order for all the green grass to burn, that won't happen in an ice age. Just to let you know. It's not going to happen in an ice age. One third of the trees burning up is going to severely decrease the oxygen. Now, if it's one third of all the trees and we keep going at the present the pace that we're at right now, that's not looking too good. And if one third of the trees are burned up, how many houses and homes are burned up? You think that's going to be good for anybody left on earth? No, those are the days of vengeance. No wonder all these people came out of great tribulation before the trumpet sounded like that. Now, I want to add some context to you. We'll refer to the book of Daniel. Daniel's vision that so many people have read, when Michael stands up and the dead rise from the everlasting life, some the everlasting contempt, Right? Right? Daniel's vision was given for who? Israel. We read Daniel in context. Daniel was troubled by his nation. That was given for Israel. This is why those in Israel, they know that prophecy very well. They know it. They know it's about them. But see, the Lord told us we have to rightly define the word of truth. Because none of us here in this room experienced the Holocaust. That was for the Jews, just like it was written in the word of God. That was not for Americans and Chinese or anybody else. That was for the Jews. You see how that works? That happened to them. It didn't happen to anybody else. God told us why it happened to them. And not one of us should ever say, well, it's just because there are bad people. You know what I say? Leave that alone, because I'm going to tell you what still stands. Those who curse them, those who curse Israel are on, up, up on a curse. Those who bless them will be blessed. By your own account, when you mess with Israel and you pass your uh, intellect over on God's people, by the way, which is God's business, you're taking your life into your own hands because if you are caught on the wrong side of that, that is God's business. In fact, there was one scripture, and I'll have to go find it, but God gave to one of his prophets and said, keep, the, uh, keep your hands up, keep your judgments off of them. In other words, in other words, that's not your business. Israel is, God, is God's sole business but he will use them as a stumbling block to the world. And there are some within Israel that are not good people. They'll be poor. But we have to remember God is God, and that's his land, his people. That's his land and his people. So be, be, people should be careful how they address that nation. Listen, if you cannot bless them, don't put yourself under a curse. Don't do it. Yeah, it's real. It's real. You know, it is, <laughs> that sounds like Israel. Israel. It is real. It's real. Those curses are real. The blessings are real. And he did say, and it still stands, he'll bless those. When he said, I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, that's who he was talking about then. When you go through the Old Testament to the New, there was an establishment of something happening. The New Jerusalem comes down there, not in Canada, not in America, 
We know ultimately that every single nation will turn its back on Israel. It's happening now. Every single nation, not excluded. They'll turn their back on them. Those lands that will be destroyed, that must be destroyed, God will have to deliver his people out of those places. He'll give the call. Now, how he does that is up to him. He wrote about it. We just don't have a full revelation about that yet. That'll be revealed. But Israel has to be purged. There will be another captivity again. There will be. It'll be the last one. See, nobody believed in Israel that they were... You know, I heard my grandmother, my grandmother's sister, told us story, told her stories and they together at the end of her life told us stories when we were younger about what actually happened. Do you not know that there were people who did believe in Jesus Christ at that time and they told them that Holocaust was coming? This is why people started leaving. They started leaving. They saw it. Was, they knew it was coming. Through the Holy Spirit they knew it was coming. And they pointed it out in the Bible. And do you know what those people said? Nah, we don't believe in that. You're, you're uh, you know, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And guess what they were doing the whole time? They were more interested in buying and selling. They had turned that place into a den of thieves yet again. But God said it. He said it would purge them. And he promised... In the end of days, they would have to go back into captivity again. He did that. See? So, there you go. There you go. It happened. He also tells us that they'll be trampled underfoot for 42 months. 42 months. They'll have to be trampled underfoot. And their places will be burned there. They will cause oblation to cease. You know what? People say, well... I'll tell you something else, too. They pray at the Wailing Wall all the time. Somebody's going to make that stop. Oblation will cease. Those prayers will stop. They'll stop. God's Word will endure forever. It will happen. We have to have understanding, because when it happens, people are going to say, God has abandoned Israel. The other half, or the other folks there say, well, there is, where's your God now, Israel? They're going to mock and they're going to scoff, not knowing that God will be looking at each and every one of them, saying, well, this one will not be in that number that no man can number, and this one won't either. And you know what? We can, As we continue to read through Revelation, you're going to notice something very curious. Now, we just went in chapter 7 and saw the 144,000 sealed. We saw a number that no man can number. By the way, I wanted to mention this. I wanted to mention something. There are, I think, 13 um, engravings in just about every single nation that says the exact same thing. You want to hear? It involves chapter 7. You guys want to hear? In all nations, let's see, uh, Brazil has them. Um, I believe Peru is the only place that does not have them. Peru has something else. And no wonder it's about to be shaken apart. I, I never want to go to Peru. Me personally, I, I don't want to go back. But anyway, there, there are engravings in every ancient city that say the exact same thing. And I find that fascinating. Here's what it says. Here's what it says. The four mighty men who expelled the Nephilim will hold back both winds and fire so that nothing stirs upon the earth and in that time the tribes of the earth will take flight that's what it says the four mighty men who expelled the Nephilim will hold back both fire and wind so that nothing stirs upon the earth and at that time the tribes of men will take flight Now, I find it amazing how that can be in so many different cultures all over this planet. All over this planet. And yet they tell where the, the, where this is going to happen. 
I found that utterly amazing. I do. Plus, you know, then we read in chapter 7, And I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. They held back the winds to you. That's written in solid gold, solid granite. It's up under the... It's like you can't even miss it. If you go into the ocean and start doing archaeology, it's there. If you go into... Um, Every single portion of the world, they, I mean, they're written on gold and silver and copper and everything else. Crystal, you name it, it's in there. The same event. And it's also funny how in this same chapter, chapter 7, when they hold back these winds so that nothing is on the earth, and, and there it said the four mighty men who expelled the Nephilim will hold back both fire and wind so that nothing stirs upon the earth. And at that time, the tribes, the tribes of the earth will take flight. And here we have the 12 tribes sealed, right? Some of that engraving is in Hebrew. Now, what is Hebrew engravings? What is that doing in Mexico? That's what I want to know. What is that doing in Mexico? What is it doing in Arizona, in Ohio? What is it doing in Canada? What is it doing in Alaska? I thought Alaska wasn't even occupied at that time. What's it doing in China? I mean, it's all over the place. All over the place. That same thing is there. Something in chapter 7. Something no one saw is going to happen. And see, the Lord said he knows. He himself, it was written. It was written that the Lord knows how to deliver his people from temptation. Right? That's written. And then we have one of the churches that said because they held the word of their patience, he, he will deliver them from going through the hour of temptation that will come upon the whole earth and everybody to try them, which are of the earth. Insight, 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 insight. And the Spirit will answer questions. Sometimes we have to pray. And here we have in, in, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Now, as it happenstance, these things are fitting together. Or is the Lord trying to tell us something? But see, some of us are not walking in full steps. Do you know why? Now, if this is a deliverance portion because we're going to keep reading if this is a deliverance portion for people now you know the six seal opens right the six seal is opening and people are hiding in the mountains and caves and the armies of the earth are dead or dying because we understood that in Isaiah 34 and the heavens are rolled together like a scroll being rolled together and the whole step of heaven is cast down and all of a sudden, all the winds and fires and everything stops, 144,000 are sealed. And this great number of people that no man can number made it out or came out of great tribulation. What tribulation? That tribulation. The sixth seal. See, the sixth seal, although it, the earth shakes and every island and mountain has moved out of its place and the armies of the earth are dead, and the men are hiding themselves in the rocks and the caves and stars are falling to earth, and the moon is as red as blood. That happens before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Okay? This is the tribulation right there. That's the tribulation. That's why everyone was in distress. And then all of a sudden in chapter 7, a great multitude that no man can number is in heaven. They came out of great tribulation. Yeah, it's getting there. Came out of great tribulation. Oh, and by the way, when he had opened the seventh seal, after, after that great many of people came out of great tribulation, all of a sudden the seventh seal is open. Boom. You know, that's the final seal, by the way. That's the seal that unlocks the trumpets and everything else. When he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half an hour. Space of a half an hour. Now, imagine this. 
at this time you got stuff falling out of the sky and everything else, right? The heavens roll together like a scroll. I still have a comment about that. But the heavens roll together like a scroll because, see, that sounds to a lot of people something impractical, something that can't happen. Even those who understand physics, even those, if you know, if you can look at Mars and say, what in the world happened to Mars? Or what in the world happened to Mercury? Or what in the world happened to these, this place and that place? You know, because it stops with Earth, and then every other planet has atmosphere, but every planet, um, Mars is the exception, which got caught in the middle. And by the way, something happened in, the, in that vicinity, but I'll get back to that. Then you have silence in heaven for the space of a half an hour. Now, the part that gets me about the silence in heaven when everything stops is that the noise stops. This silence, in, in order for there to be silence in the heavens, that means nothing is happen, happening in the heavens. Something weighty is happening. Now, we have some people who, you know, they... they people have their own ideas, right? But I have this habit of never putting the Lord in a box, right? I just can't put him in a box. I've seen too many weird things myself. There, there's no way I can put him in a box. I've seen physics defied. You know what men think is fanciful? Let's take a dragon, for instance, right? Not to get off the subject. Let's take a dragon. Fire-breathing dragon, right? That's what they called them back in the old days. Come to find out, there's a lizard that looks like an iguana. It grows to about 13 feet long, has the same abilities as an electric eel, but about tenfold. It will electrocute you and burn your flesh if it touches you, though it's not on fire. It's like an electric eel, but it's a lizard. And it's still a species out there, just like that. So, you know, I, I can't put them in a box. I, I can't rationalize everything. No, they're, they're, they have them in Brazil. They have smaller specimens in Brazil. They have them on the islands and so forth. They're, they're real rare, but, they, but they're out there. But I can't put God in the box. Now, the silence in heaven, people have their um, theories and so forth, right? But here's what I see. I see everything stopped. And it would appear, just by reading this, now this is me, just by reading this, that everything got really quiet. First of all, first of all, the angels hold back all the winds. Nothing is blowing upon the earth. In chapter 7, we see that. The four angels standing on the four corners of the earth hold the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, or on the sea, nor on any tree. Everything stops. All of a sudden, the 144,000 are sealed. Those who uh, came out of great tribulation are noted. In the, set, in the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half an hour. Now, you know what? When I looked at this again and kept reading it through, and I said, what in the world is that? I saw something I didn't see before. I did. Because when the angels held back the winds of the earth, that nothing stirred upon the earth, could it be at the same time that was the silence in the heavens? Not only did the earth, everything on the earth stop moving, but everything in the heavens stop moving. Because if the wind is not stirring up on the earth and the wind's not blowing on anything, nothing in the heavens is moving. Does that make sense? I just saw it that way. That's, I just saw it that way. I just saw it that way. So the angels are holding back the four winds. And in order for the winds to stop moving up on the earth, for those angels to hold back the four winds, then that means the clouds are not moving. Could it be that John, John, seeing these angels, hold everything still, could it be that he also saw the clouds stop? Everything stopped. Could it be? See, often I'll put myself in... The, the writer's perspective. He's being shown these things. He saw these angels hold back the winds. If the wind is not blowing and nothing is stirring upon the earth, the clouds aren't either. Right? If the wind's not blowing, 
Well, then the clouds are not moving. So, yeah, did time stand still? Did time stop? And you know what? I did have a curious dream once, and I'll share it. I did have a dream one time that everything did stop. But hear me out. Everything. When I say everything stopped, everything stopped. People stopped. Birds stopped. Insects stopped. Everything. But I was walking in between people, and I started to see a lot of other children and people walking, happy. Everything stopped. All your physical, everything was, was different. But we were walking through everybody, and you could hear kids laughing. But the other half of humanity and the birds and the, everything else was frozen in time, as though everything was a statue. But we were moving freely to one place. We were all going to one place. All going to one place. Columbus, Ohio, Kathy. All going to one place. I thought it was beautiful because you could look at people and they were froze like statues. Nothing was moving. Anyway, that was a dream. By the way, I had that dream when I was uh, 13, I think. 12 or 13. I think it was 12 or 13. Never understood them. Never really paid attention to that. But in chapter 7, we see the angels holding back the winds. And then in chapter 8... We see silence in the heavens for the space of half an hour. Could those four angels stop everything? If the wind stops it, nothing blows. And these other etchings and so forth say that fires stop too. Fires and winds stop that nothing's nothing stirred upon the earth. And if John sees the wind stop, how could he see the wind stop? How could, he, how could he visualize this? He said, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. If he saw them holding them, well then, maybe he said they were holding them because the clouds and everything else stopped. Maybe everything stopped. Then all of a sudden, um, that great number is seen, and we get to chapter 8, where it says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Maybe that half hour was the ending, and everything was about to go back to motion again. Ask me. I'm just reading. I'm just reading. I'm just reading. But I'd never looked at it that way before until I continuously read through. I continuously read through. That with the other things, excuse me, the other things that... uh, I know about it. And seeing it from John's perspective, because he saw those four angels holding back those wounds. Don't let me bore you. Anyway, see, sometimes we look for a deep, 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 deep meaning. But it could be right there if we just read it through. Right there. Okay. Now, I never caught that before myself. Never caught that before. So he takes the prayers of the saints. He's going to cast it to earth. Everybody, hold on. We're going to take a short break. That was a long way. And you know what? There's a lot to cover. There's just not enough time. And this study, I should have started this study at 2 o'clock. Maybe we could have uh, gotten somewhere. Okay, Tatum, I'll tell you what, folks. We are going to leave this at Chapter 8, maybe. And, uh, yeah, it was pretty short. You guys think it was a long time? Was it a long time, a short time? Uh, Mike F.E., Fifth Element, better have recorded this one. I hope he's, someone recorded it. They can get back with me, um, and we'll get them in the archives. Okay. Tatum it is. Let's get Tatum on here. Tatum, wake up. No time for sleeping. There's just, you know what, I wanted to share more. There's just so much more I have to share with you, even getting down to uh, this level. There's a whole lot more I need to share. Okay, let's see. Tatum... Somebody has to send me, I don't keep phone numbers, so somebody will have to send me Tatum's phone number, the whole thing. So listen, I'm making Mike, F.E., an uploaded uh, location. 
after he gets done with the recordings, he'll be able to upload them. They will be added to the archives so that you guys can, um, so we have uh, three so far? Is it two or three? Three. And, uh, yeah, you guys can go back to the archives. Where's Tatum? Tatum go to sleep? Oh, there it is. All right, let's see if this works. Patty Point, is that Tatum's number? What's up with, with something happened to Mars, and it concerns the sky rolling together. Like I said, there are things that, uh, oh, there it is. You know what? You know what, Patty? I had it all the time with big letters on there that says Tatum. Oh, boy. All right, we're going to see if we can get her on the phone. It's ringing. Hi, Brother Mike. Hey, Tatum, how you doing? You're going to sing us a song. Yes, I'm going to sing the same song I sung on Pastor Paul today. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I'll start Am I on now? Are we ready? Yeah. Yeah, you're on now. You're live. <laughs> Okay, this is a uh, Christian Stanfield. His song, One Thing Remains. Okay. And he's higher than the mountains that I face. And he's stronger than the power of the grave. And he's constant in the trial and the change. This one thing. He remains. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love. Oh, and in death. In life, I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love. And my debt is paid. There's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love. Because your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love, there's nothing like it. That's all. <laughs> I'm done, though. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you. you. Have a really That's good perfect. Huh? Oh, thank you. I, I was love tempted to sing harmony. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't have a headset. I can do that. Um, your your phone will blow out. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. If I if I sing harmony, if I sing harmony, everybody's gonna really think it's the uh, seventh seal. <laughs> Brother Michael, we know you can sing. I heard you. You can sing. You can sing. Only in, you in court. Only in court. Huh? Okay, I sing well, only in court. <laughs> What's that mean? What's that mean? I'm, I'm about to... In oh, court? never mind. Okay. Court. <laughs> <laughs> so I thank you so much, and I love Bible Friday night. I just love you, Brother Mike. We all love you. So I just want to say that we all love you. Oh, that's a good thing, too. I love you guys, too. I love you guys, too. Little sis, you have a very, very good voice. I think you're uh, you. anointed to sing. I really do. You know, I was always shy all my life, and I was, like, worried about other. I I don't care anymore. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not really concerned about what people think. I'm singing to him. You know, I thought my first love was a rap. <laughs> you know, I'm not concerned about being shy anymore. You know, so thank you, Brother Michael. That's what counts. I think it's awesome. Okay. I think it's awesome. Thank you. Tatum, Thank appreciate you. you, little sis. Appreciate you, too. God bless you. Okay. Stay safe. All Bye. right, sis. Bye-bye. 
Let's see. Hopefully I didn't hang up on myself. No, I did it right this time. Well, folks, it is 10 o'clock. That means Dr. Larry of the News will be on. So I'm going to get them on the uh, on this thing. And you know what? It was an awesome study. I really needed about two more hours. I did. Oh, no news tonight? Are you serious? Uh-oh. Well, see, it's not fair. Some people have said, well, that was the end of the Bible study. So uh, whew, I can't do it. I can't do it. Okay, Mars. Mars. Mars had its atmosphere stripped from something. Now, as I said before, I do not put uh, our father in a box or, or interpret his ways with ours. But Mars, their atmosphere was stripped, and it's just now starting to come back. Atmosphere is not happenstance, by the way. And you know what? This is so funny, because scientists state continuously... Well, you know, Earth is a rock that was out there, and all of a sudden it just, you know, the atmosphere just formed around it. No. Because you know what? Again, there's no atmosphere on Mars or Mercury. And, and um, um, Venus has an atmosphere. That's acidic, right? You guys have heard that. that Venus has this acidic atmosphere that will just burn up any metal in there. Well, that's great. The only problem is for the last, what was it, 32 years, a probe has been on the surface of Venus that has not burned up or degraded materially. So we know that's not true either. That's not true. But Mars has no atmosphere. But it does have pyramids all over the place. It would appear that uh, some of the fallen angels if you read the book of Enoch, and of course we read in Jude, they gave reference to the book of Enoch, had inhabitants on that estate. It did. And if you think that um, it can't, you, that uh, nobody can be there right now, or there's, there's, you know, you don't know the truth of the whole situation. You, science is laden people with lies. Really. They're more than lies. Their limitations. That's what they've done. See, you don't have the optics to look onto the surface of Mars. So Mars is interpreted to you through the eyes of those who can reach Mars. That's what's happening. And there's just too much going on with Mars. And again, you know, if you take out the red filter of any Mars image, it looks just like Earth. All you have to do for you guys who are good in Adobe or Corel or something like that, go into the filters, right, tone back the red filter, and all of a sudden the colors match up perfectly and it looks just like Earth. Never understood that. Also, when you're looking at the probe pictures, right, of the rovers and so forth, now the only one they did cut the transmission to was the Phoenix mission. They had to cut that one, you know. Um, so you're seeing this stuff, and you're buying into something, saying that um, Mars has was never inhabited, doesn't have seasons. However, there are froze, frozen bodies of water there. Um, there's water on the moon, lots of water on the moon. Um, if we have things on the moon right now. We do things on the moon right now. And you know what? One day, they're going to come forward and, and, and tell you guys something. You're going to do one or two things, three things. You're going to say, I knew it. I knew it. I knew someone someone else was out there. Or you're going to say, that's a scary thought. I don't want to think about that. Or you're going to say they're liars. You're going to do one of the three. But here's a problem. If you say you knew it, there's life out there, what context do you have so that you keep your biblical roots? Because you just can't magically start thinking. There are other life forms out there. This, this, this will place you into the hands of the elite who want you to believe that life out there... Oh, and please, let me, let me clarify this for you. Demons are here on Earth, not out there, okay? Demons are here, not out there. But we know, we know that Satan has a war with Michael and his angels. Right? Satan and his angels, Michael and his angels have a war, and Satan is cast to earth. He's cast to earth. 
before he even realizes he's cast earth, he's cast earth. And one third of his things up there with him are cast too. Now, these are not demons, these are fallen angels. One third of the fallen angels that fell that are following Satan get cast here. Demons are not angels. Demons are spirits that do the bidding of Lucifer and his uh, captains and so forth. See, all this has to be put in a true context. Just like angels, Michael and Gabriel and Raphael and Uriel and so forth, they have angels working beneath them. Lots of angels working beneath them. When the angels first made it with women and they had children, right? Their children lived for 500 years and then when they died, because they were neither human nor angel, their spirits were known as evil spirits or demons. By the way, that word demon means intelligence. Givers of knowledge. So, when you're saying an evil spirit, right, evil spirit, like ghosts and, and um, uh, people possessed by things like Leviathan, Legion, and so forth, right, these things are in fact offspring of the fallen angels their bodies died, but their spirits did not. Their spirits don't go back to God because they did not come from God. Their spirits stay right here on earth. They stay right here on earth. You guys got that? So they're lingering around. You can't kill them. And they were terrified to death that Jesus was going to send them to hell when he saw them. That's why they begged to be thrown into the pigs. And the reason why I'm saying this is because many people every single day risk their lives to combat these things that you know nothing about. You don't know some of the missions that are sanctioned by the nations to find a way to overcome them. Here's a problem. Not one nation knows how to overcome them. They don't. They're trying everything. Everything they're trying. They're trying to reestablish the power of the pyramids. Do you know what a pyramid really is, guys? I'll save that for the Hagmans. I can't say it here. But I'll say this. I'll say this. You are used to energy, right? You're used to energy, like electricity, solar energy, radiation, and so forth. Here's the energy you know nothing about. It's called bioenergy, cosmic energy, which is not in the in the measurable field of energy. I'll give you some radar stories that we run into often. And we have to add filters to certain equipment so that we don't get uh, messed up by them. Now, please listen. If you want to know the truth, I'm going to say this truth one time. The rest, I'm going to say for the Hagmans. But there are occasions when um, over the pyramids, large energy signatures are picked up. Right? This began to happen Back into back in the 40s, when radar really, um, when the technology really started to boom. Come to find out, the shape of a pyramid concentrates energy at its core, but it only concentrates energy at its core if it's placed on the Earth, where natural ley lines exist. And so that shape of a pyramid does, in fact, concentrate energy. You can do this with popsicle sticks. If you, well, it has to be iron, unless you have some bricks. If you built a pyramid yourself, you could take a multimeter or a gauze meter, something like that, and you would actually uh, see that uh, energy has increased at least 20 times. If you place the plant and the sunlight, one inside of a pyramid, the one inside of the pyramid, would grow faster than the one outside of the pyramid. Okay? Scientists have already used antibiotics and did a controlled measurement, I think it was 20 times in a row. They had antibiotics. Antibiotics. They randomly placed a few in a pyramid and placed a few outside of the pyramid. After 28 days, the antibiotics within the pyramid Right Now, we're looking at a pyramid shape, and then we're looking at a cube shape. The ones that were inside the pyramid, their potency increased 500% over the ones that were in the cube shape. Just to let you know, now they've known about this. They're not going to print it or anything. That's just the way it is. And so the ancients, what the ancients did was they took this knowledge, 
but they also took the instructions away from the pyramids of how they worked, but they took this knowledge and capitalized upon it. When the angels did, when they fell, they taught men these things. These are enchantments, incantations, and so forth, using the natural energies of the earth to do things, to regenerate the flesh they try. A, a host of things. There are many, many things people don't know about. Egypt is keeping so many secrets, it's pathetic. So are many of the other nations. Now they're in a fight to find restoration technologies because they know the time is close. And I'm going to be honest with you. They don't know what to do with these things. They know they're coming. They know the war is going to take place. But you know what? Everybody who gives credence to the Illuminati and all these other groups, they don't know what to do with them either. But it takes a biblical reference to understand this. Biblical reference. And we can find them. We can find the biblical references. But I'm telling you now, the nations of the world are in a type of trauma because they don't know what to do with these things. They don't know what to do. By the way, Behemoth and Leviathan are two of the strongest um, dark entities on this planet right now that have, people have run into. And see, you know the beautiful part? that None of that stuff can penetrate the Holy Spirit. You've got your own bio-generator. It's called the Holy Spirit. All they can do is replicate. Let me, let me tell you something. Satan truly tries to counterfeit any power of God. Any, any power of God Satan tries to um, mimic. He impersonates it. So guess what? The Father can heal. The Holy Spirit can empower a person to be quickened and their body can be quickened. Well, Satan has a different type of science that he taught men through... Uh, um, it was Azazel and um, some of the other fallen angels taught men these things, enlightened them. You know, stories about them go, even the angel in the garden is mentioned in the book of Enoch. I'm not going to say it here because you need context when you're reading it to say, ah, okay, that's who he is. Because the original Hebrew makes references to all those angels. They just generalized them into Satan. Because they're all under his, you know, authority. Those that are not bound right now, they're all under his authority. He was a um, Satan was a uh, one of the big wigs to the, to the angels. He's one of the big wigs. Anyway, so they have all this stuff in ancient times, and I'm telling you now, if you look closely, many, many, many wars, many wars, initialized from controlling that type of thing. They initialize from that. And so, that's the way that works. Folks, hold on just a minute. I'll be right back because I'm not done talking. Not quite yet, but we'll talk some more. Just a second. Whew. Man, it's been a long night. I cannot believe it's 1017. But we lost half of our audience. Um, so I can't, I, you know, can't go back to that. Listen, folks, while we're on the subject. Um, I have a personal favor to ask each and every one of you. And it is this. When you're reading scripture, right? Reading scripture is just like prayer. It's just like prayer. It has to be sincere. Um, your, your heart must be open to the Lord. You cannot read scripture with preconceived notions. Because if your mind is full of wisdom, how can you ever receive, if your mind is full of your own wisdom, how can you receive wisdom to understand the scriptures you're reading? Um, and don't be shaken by any news that you may hear. Certainly don't panic. Don't, don't, uh, don't do that. It's important that you understand that you're covered by the blood of the Lamb. And we already read tonight that a great multitude that no man can number came out of great tribulation. They came out of great tribulation. Nevertheless, they were in, you know what, in some of this stuff, even right now, is tribulation. If your life is not smooth, right, then what is that? Is that not tribulation? And we know that tribulation works patience. 
And above all things, God does require patience of His children. Because that same patience works hope. Just remember that. Because some people are going to get carried away in the news that they hear. They get, they, they'll, they're going to get uh, overwhelmed, if you will. And sometimes when you're hearing news of any sort, certainly if it's bad news, sometimes you have to be very still, extremely still. Search for the wisdom of the Father's, the Father's wisdom, so that you can understand what's happening not jumping over to assumptions and conclusions and so forth because above all things you want to be stationary rooted, grounded if you're rooted and grounded you're not so easily shaken you may bend to the left and bend to the right but you're still rooted you won't be uprooted so guess what the winds of a storm will affect even the strongest trees. But the strength of a tree is in the depths and the strength of its roots. It can lose branches. It can lose this, that, and the other. But it's still rooted. That's where we need to be. We need to be rooted and grounded. We're going to be pruned, yes. But we're rooted and grounded. Having said that, I already see a tactic of the enemy. You know, there's a scripture that says that God will not have us ignorant concerning the devices of the enemy. Right? Also, you've heard the term, the term that people use, when you go to a different country, you're left to your own devices. That means you have to use your wisdom to function in those countries. The way you work how you're going to work is left up to you. Now, the Lord said he would, not, he would not have us ignorant concerning the devices of the enemy. How the enemy works. Don't ignore how he works. Be patient and observe how he works. It's time for you to begin to identify him in your life and how he's working. Not to point a person out. You don't point at a person and say, Satan, Satan. You don't do that. But guess what? To avoid the lures and the traps of the enemy, you have to know that they are from the enemy, or you'll step right into it. You'll step into it. If you don't know of a pit set before you, because because you willingly ignored all the signs, You're going to fall into that hole. That's what's going to happen. So let's not ignore it, but use everything the Father sends to us that adds to our wisdom. See, men reject wisdom because they simply won't consider things. God does not cause... He he doesn't do things accidentally. Every single thing that happens in our life, good or bad, is for an end purpose... And if you are a believer in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, then everything you go through is for your good. That's why it says, all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord who are called according to His purpose. Because if you do, in fact, love Him, you're not left at the whim of the wind. Everything, everything is used for your growth good or bad and we've all taken tests we didn't want to take we've all studied subjects we did not want to study we did this in school we did it in school and so the same thing applies the same process applies there are going to be things that we don't want to do out of the flesh because it's inconvenient but yet the Lord is showing us things that we must know And believe me, when you know them, they will serve you well. They'll serve you well. God's not going to expose you to anything that's going to take your soul. He takes no pleasure in death of anybody. He's not going to put you in a situation beyond that which you can bear. 
He certainly is not going to put you in a situation that's going to take you. That means all things, all things that are in your life for your learning, for your growth. And apparently, a time is coming we're going to need it, so we can no longer afford to reject it. We have to get up, dust our pants off. Let's get our gear and begin to walk. We have to begin this walk. It's time. It's just time to take that walk, that walk in truth, in God's will, pruning ourselves, purging ourselves. You know, I've learned something else of the Lord, and it is this. There are certain things, there are certain branches on me I know how to prune. I don't have to wait on him to do it, because through his holy word, he has told me what they are. I can purge them. But the first thing I cannot do is to say, I am important and have pride in my life. Because if pride is in your life, you'll never notice you have to be pruned. Pride is dangerous. If you don't notice you have to be pruned, well, you're left at the hands of the pruners that may prune you at the wrong time. It'll still be effective, but you're going to remember that pruning. I'd rather do it myself by trusting in God's Word and say, well, don't need that. Don't need this. Don't need that. Oop, I need this. This is nourishment. This is nourishment. This is not. Get rid of pride. If you get rid of pride, your eyes are open. The scales seem to come off. The mist, the haze is lifted. You know, just like in the end, in the end, the same thing will happen to God's children, to his bride. They'll no longer be blinded. Its reason is real as like it is. And guess what? It's for our benefit at the time. And don't try to figure it out. Because God is God. And we are just starting. But God is God. But uh, remember that the world is the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. Remember that. That's what the world is. That's why to love the world is to have enmity with God. Is to have separation with Him. We are in the world, but not of the world. We're not of the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. That's why some of you tempting to be like the other person. And it's not going to work. Because you yourself know those things are not within you. And if they are within you, you yourself know they don't belong. All right. Now, did I hear Pastor Paul say something about uh, um, scientists or something like that? We're going to have a meeting and say some things about some inbounds and this, that, and the other. I think I heard some people speaking about that. See, sometimes on the inside, you know a little too much, and, and then you don't get to uh, interpret the public side too much. Now, I don't want to say anything that's going to get me or you in trouble, but uh, I better heard some, someone say that. At any rate, we know it's coming. So tomorrow, Lord willing, we will continue with the uh, seventh seal, the silence. Did you guys get that about the silence? We'll go back over that tomorrow with the silence, because... Lots of people interpret this in many different ways, but I'm, I'm telling you, it just popped out of me. It just popped out of me. So um, we'll see. We'll see. But remember, with, with the book of Revelation, you know, I'm not going to change anything. And if I feel so, I'm not going to assume either. But I will show you those things that jump out of 2014. Tomorrow on Earth Day, the last second, there's going to be a things the Lord reveals to me. Because like I said, sometimes people make a deep subject out of things. Sometimes they do. That is just right there. It's plain. It's just very plain. And in our complex minds, it's hard to capture something plain. Again, one of the analogies would be if I told someone I stubbed my toe two hours ago, they would say, ah, oh, there's something to that. Something very prophetic, and no, it's not. Nothing's prophetic. 
Nothing and I just stubbed my toe two hours ago. And it hurt. That's all there is to it. And sometimes things are written so plainly that it escapes us. It does. It will escape us. Because we're looking for something deeper. And guess what? It's not that deep. They did that when Jesus was there. Oh, well. Folks, it's been nice. It's been real. I'm going to spare you the, the, uh, um, my jabber jaws. So I'm going to stop so I can have some coffee and do some reports and, and uh, um, pray a little bit. I have to share with you, I am unsettled for the coming days. Not for the sake of you guys, just for the sake of situations. And sometimes, you know what, I can't tell you what's going on, but I can ask you to pray that God, God remember His mercy. I can ask you to pray that God remember His mercy towards mankind. And to truly be merciful to the little ones. So, folks, I love you. I shall see you tomorrow, God willing, Lord willing. We'll jump right back into chapter 8 and continue. And with that, I will say good night.